Hello and all welcome back to Talk Neuro City. Jack Reeve alongside the voice of reason today. No Chris Reeve, thank goodness. It's Connor Southwell of the EDP and Pink and Connor, great to have you back on the channel. Um, we were just speaking off camera. We had you on the channel, what felt like about two years ago. It was actually two and a half weeks ago. And so much has changed since we last spoke, both on and off the pitch. So, so wanted to um wanted to get your thoughts and feelings on, on, on where we're at with things at the moment. Um God, it must have been a hectic couple of weeks for you and uh, and, and and all of your team at the at the Pinkham. Yeah, it's 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 been manic. F thankfully, you know, I know we sort of I think last time I was on, we spoke a little bit about deadline day and hoping that it didn't go uh, didn't go into the early hours. It was the right side of midnight, which I, I deem as a success. It was only 20 minutes to the right side of midnight, but it was it was still a success from that perspective. And obviously then going to Coventry the next day to get a win. But yeah, it's been it's been exhausting. It always is. It's frantic. And, and you know, as, as you know, well, no, like one message, one phone call, one you know, report dropping and, and your whole day changes and shifts and uh, it can become quite difficult to switch off because things news doesn't wait for anybody. So it can pop up at 11 o'clock at night, six o'clock in the morning and, you know, you have to be on it. So, um, yeah, th th this time's a little bit nicer because I can sort of put the phone down for a few hours knowing that it's not all going to kick off or whatnot. So that's quite nice. I think the last time we spoke, we, we'd seen two games. We'd seen the the, the harrowing defeat to Oxford and, uh, and the win against Stevenage in the Cup. And I don't know about you, but I can't. I was looking at things with with part excitement and part anxiety. There was a lot of a lot of uncertainty around the place. We didn't know what the Scott squad was going to look like. I titled the last video um, the, the kind of latest on Johnny Rowe. I mean, that whole saga has, has started and, uh, and ended. I mean, you know, as, as we as we sit here, at, you know, start of September, f things feel a lot more settled now, and it feels like there's a there's an identity about the place again. Yeah, it does. And um, funny enough, I, I wrote a piece on this yesterday, but um, you, you you look at it and if you were from the outside, I think you would you'd look at it and you go, well, they've, they've won one in four. They've sold two of their best players. Um, you know, they, they, they had a top six finish and now they're sort of in a period of transition. What, why is there so much optimism? And I think it can be quite hard to identify, but I think it's what you spoke about there. It's um, strategy, first and foremost. It's that, that substance behind the project that I think people are, are really feeling and connecting with that uh, story as Johannes Hotorup keeps keeps saying that that willingness to connect with that is is something that's breeding that but equally what people are seeing on the pitch and people's eyes don't lie to them and football fans are intelligent and they can see I think when um, performances are improving but but equally when there is an alignment between what is being delivered in terms of their head coach I want to play like X and then you play like X I think that that breeds trust as well so I think that's where the, the optimism is born from. We've obviously the acceptance, and I think Johannes has said this himself on a few occasions, that actually they need to get those results, why they build to almost retain that. And that's why I think the, the last three weeks have been so big. Um, because yes, it's it's one win in four, but it's, it's also one defeat in four as well. So I think you can be flipped however you like, but you're right, the performances are there. It feels like there's real improvement. And I think Equally, the, the fact that people have, you know, this is a road that Norwich fans have been down before in 2017. But actually, I think if you look at it uh, objectively, you could say the level of performance that they've produced over the last three weeks, they, they probably didn't have a three weeks like that in, in the first year under under Daniel Farker, I think it's fair to say. So it does feel like something is building here. Um, and it's just obviously up to Johannes Hoftorup, Ben Napper and everybody else to prove that that cautious optimism can be turned into real solid belief I think and that comes with obviously um, maintaining what they've done so far because I think the last as you well know the last thing Norwich fans need is another false storm. Absolutely I, I think you know the pace in which things can change in, in, in football can sometimes come at the risk of kind of decrediting some of the really good work that's happened and I look back to that afternoon at, at the Kassam Stadium with three stands and a, and a gale blowing through that near the Hollywood Bowl and, and I was just looking at things going you know where do we go from here? And and it's never quite as bad and it's never quite as good as I think we, we make out as fans. And you're obviously a slightly more level-headed now being being the superb journalist you are. But just how kind of um, bad was it in that moment and how much good work has been done by Napa and Tore Up and, and every, everyone else at the football club since that point to try and get things in a position to really kick on this season? Yeah, I think I think it was bad. And, you know, when you've got a head coach standing post-match talking about how cultures need to change, that doesn't feel like a, a brilliant position to be in week one into a project. And I think 
you know, let's not forget for him as well. That was a big day for him. It was his first day as, as Norwich City head coach, first day properly into a job, introducing himself to fans because we all know that pre-season is, is caveated and, and, and nuanced beyond results. So it was a big day for him. And then to have, you know, your, arguably your best player come to you 20 minutes before a team meeting and say he, he's uh, not motivated to play and everything unfolds in the way it does. I, I can imagine, you know, if I was him and I'm sure other people in his position would have reacted very differently to what he did. But showed real composure. And I, I think actually what I've sort of felt the last few weeks is what we've just discussed in terms of that fan feeling and the fans reacting positively to what they're seeing. I think the players are probably feeding on that a little bit as well because they can feel what the fans are feeling and they can also see the type of response it does. And we all know in, in whatever line of work we do, if you're if what you're doing is being met with praise and being met with optimism and positivity, you go, oh, okay, I'm going to do this again because I like that feeling. Everyone likes that feeling. So I think what they've done in the last few weeks to really, and I think it did damage them a bit, keeping players who didn't want to be at the club because they wanted to hold out for valuations. But what they've got now is real clarity. That squad has real clarity. They all know they're going to be here until at least January. Um, and really, they've got little choice but to, to crack on with it. But equally, I think, you know, Kenny McLean said it in a post-match interview I, I did with him, they're feeling improvement daily. And that is, that's the major thing, because if you want to get players on board, and I remember speaking to Chris Sutton and, uh, and other um, professional players about this, the first few weeks as a head coach is so important to make that first impression, that connection with your players. And it does feel like he's he's getting that now. And I think we, we've all seen that probably in the last three performances where every one of them has contained probably a little sprinkling more or a slightly different sprinkling of what he wants to, to implement. And so I think that is sign that from where we were at Oxford, where he was stood post-match talking about cultures to where we were at Coventry with him speaking about mentality and how he's seen a growth in this group. I think it's really, really difficult not to feel encouraged with that. And, and him, Glenn Riddle's home, his coaching team, they deserve massive credit, I think, for the work that they've done. Ben Napper as well in, in holding firm and, and probably laying down the law in terms of what that behaviour needs to look like as well. So all of these things have been majorly important. And that's why probably in a weird, twisted kind of way, the Abu Kamara situation, the John Rowe situation in the long term might prove to be quite beneficial in terms of him from a dressing room standpoint. You mentioned um, Glenn Riddle's home there. It's well worth um, to everyone watching, tuning in to, to the Pinkins interview with him because I mean, rarely do. Um, I mean, I, I think if you'd asked me kind of assistant managers of past at, at Norwich City, I'd, I'd be able to name very few of them. But it seems like he's taking quite a prominent role and that's well worth a watch. We'll get on to the new signings shortly, Connor. But just on some of the old guard, Kenny McLean, Shane Duffy, Angus Gunn, Josh Sargent, it was still very prominent in this Johannes Hoftorp starting 11. Do you think that he has buy-in from, from those players? Do you think that they're, you know, on board with, with, with this new project? S certainly feels that way. De definitely Kenny McLean, having had a 10-minute conversation with him after one of the home games. I think it was Sheffield United. I, I definitely get that sense that that he is not just saying it as a token. He, he, he means what he is saying in terms of the style of play. Um, Sergeant, I mean, you only have to look at the work that he got through on Saturday and didn't score. But what he offered the team was was tremendous, really, in terms of being a physical presence and uh, and what he contributed, got them up the pitch. I, I think you can you don't do that unless you're committed to something, I would say. So it does it does feel and look that way. And I think this is the probably the nuance in the debate around the experience. And it's been quite easy, I think, for people to look at Grant Hanley and Shane Duffy and to say, well, you know, they're, they're past their best. They don't have a role to play. But it, it doesn't quite work like that because... Again, we've just mapped out kind of the timeline. If, you, if you're Johannes Hoftor up and you've got you know players around you kicking off and putting transfer requests in, you need that experience core. And, and for all of the criticisms of, let's say, Grant Hanley, what he is is an exceptional captain and somebody who who is really well thought of and well respected in that dressing room. And I think the fact that you know the week or the week after the the Oxford debacle, he went and met Johnny Rowe outside the club premises and spoke to him and uh, and did all of that stuff. That that kind of shows, I think, the role that he has to play. So the last thing that Johannes Hoftorp needs is almost to then go and pick a fight with those guys. Um, I, I just think that makes life really difficult in in your in your first few weeks. And obviously, equally, I think we've seen in the last two weeks how Shane Duffy's really grown into it and his performances have, have been really positive and mentioned Josh Sargent as well and, and Kenny McLean. Um, it was quite an interesting bit post-match where Johannes Hoftorp was quite honest and said he hadn't been happy with his level of performance and at Coventry it was much better. So I think you can see guys responding to him now, which is which is really positive and they have a key role to play. At Norgeland, he, he had a 35-year-old centre-back who played every week for him. So yes, he is somebody that believes in youth, but I think also he, he is somebody that does place a real value in experience because 
let's be honest, if, if you're going to have the back line that Norwich have at the moment, which is Callum Doyle, Ben Krasene, two 20-year-olds, Jack Stacey, who is, you know, I mean, he's not, he's not old in footballing terms, <laughs> but he's, he's, he's not, not one that we would say is, is a development player. You, you probably need a Shane Duffy in there to, to lead and cajole with Kenny McLean in front. So it's, it's all about getting that balance right. And I think he, in the last few weeks, it feels like he's settled upon definitely a more balanced way of, of getting the best out of that experience, but equally using it to, to help the, the young guys away. And I think you've got, with Shane Duffy in particular, a, a nice bit of the moment where he's probably helping Callum Doyle and Callum Doyle's probably helping him raise his level as well. So that, that is a good example, I think, of almost the seesaw effect of, of how you can balance that effectively. Absolutely. And in terms of trying to build that squad, it was a very active summer transfer window. I'm just going to run through the, the names in which we brought in and then we'll have a bit of a discussion on some of the sales as well. I'm not going to mention some of the development players um, that, that were brought in. And um, although I do love the name Billy G, I mean, he's he <laughs> that bloke cannot have a great career with that name. Um, so fantastic it's, headlines. It, sorry. Yeah, fantastic, yeah. Fantastic headlines in that. Absolutely. Um, so the, the, the ins were Jose Cordoba, um, Ben Crescene, Callum Doyle, Forsen Amanqua, Ante Sienat, Oscar Schwartel, um, Ben Salam, um, Slimane, Cade Gordon. Um, and that was kind of the, 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 the deadline day deals. I mean, when you go through that list, Connor, um, most of them are already featured in, in fairly prominent roles. And, and, and actually, having watched all of them now at this point, other than Cade Gordon, I've been fairly impressed with all of them. And, and I feel quite positive about that are you of the same opinion yeah I, I am absolutely and I think you know the, the core thing that runs through all of them I think is their age and, and the fact I think Slimani is the oldest one and he's, he's 23 even though uh, I agree I agree with your your podcast he looks about 35 so <laughs> yeah, I was um, I could not believe when I read that he was 23 do, do you know what I saw I saw him when it warming up against Coventry and actually turned to to pad and went I, I know he was but I can't remember him being that big last week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he, he seemed to have, uh, and, and I guess that's because you, obviously you pay more attention to them. But yeah, I think in terms of, it's been really nice to see a strategy and there was a strategy last year. They, they went after more experienced players. So it's not an absence of strategy um, compared to last year, but I think it's a, a definite pivot and one that feels a lot more Norwich City historically in terms of young players and definitely in the second tier, probably what it feels like they need to be. Um almost a return to, and this is what it's felt for me all summer, probably ins and out. It, it is a pivot and a return to a club that wants to be a player trading organisation rather than one that probably focused too much on outcome last year and, and was chasing results. And I think when you're in that situation, when you're just chasing results, that's fine if you then get them. But if you don't, I think we all saw where that ends up. And equally, even when you do, it's a bit of, oh, okay, right, um, we're just going to go on to the next one now. I think it, this does feel a little bit bigger than this. Like you say, there's individuals there that I think you can you can buy into in terms of their development and their improvement. And what you're seeing now is is players like Oscar Schwartow, 18, <clears throat> who are going to make mistakes because they're 18, but that's almost packaged into the fact they're going to get better as opposed to last year. It was maybe players who felt rightly or wrongly like they're on the way down and they're making mistakes and, and this is kind of the ceiling. This is where they're at and you have to package that into the team. So I think it's, it's encouragement from that side, but I agree with you. I think everyone so far has looked like it can add value um, to the team in the here and now, but equally in, in the mid to long term. And, um, you know, Force and Amanqua, I think is a really good example because, uh, in Sheffield United against Sheffield United, brilliant touch to set up the goal, but yeah. equally gave a pass away to concede the goal, and and that's probably Norwich's recruitment in a nutshell. That these are players who are going to provide really good moments, but but equally uh, are going to show that they're a little bit raw around the edges as well. So I think there's a lot of excitement there, but but equally it's uh, for me an absolute clear signal in terms of what Ben Napper in particular, but also what Johannes Hofftorup wants to do, and the fact that they've gone in this direction that explains probably to people a lot more why they wanted Johannes Hoftorup, a coach who, you know, I saw a massive list the other day of Norgeal and players who have gone for big money. And, and that is, that's why Norwich City wanted him because he's a, a de real developer of talent. And I think the pleasing thing that I picked up from your coverage over the summer, Connor, was the fact that, you know, a lot of these players, if not all of the players have been on the radar of either Napa mm. or Torup or both or Norwich City for a long while. I mean, Callum Doyle, we seem to be going after for ages. I know that, you know, Torup has worked with a couple of these players before. It feels like there's real certainty around what they'll bring, what they can add, that, you know, the, the, the chinks in our armour that we needed to kind of patch up. And before it's felt a little bit kind of, oh, it might work, it might not. This feels like there's real strategy and, and procedure around all of what we've done. 
Yeah, hundred percent, and and that word strategy is the big one because I think if you if you meet Ben Napper or you speak to Ben Napper about his work, strategy is is the one that you come away thinking and and process and and he's not someone who's who's knee jerk. You know, if an agent rings him up and says, "Look, I've got a cracking player here," which is which you know can happen, and Norwich in the past have gone, "Oh, brilliant, yeah, we'll take them." That wasn't the case. It was it was actually, and and this was the case on deadline day as well, and you could see it. It was. Um, okay, if if we want a permanent uh, wide addition, that that is the the number one outcome. But equally, we've got loan plates spinning here in case it gets a little bit too late, and it got a little bit too late, and they had a backup plan to go and and do, and they had sort of considered options in that as well. So, yeah, all of these players have been watched for for a significant period of time. They've all sort of had files in in Norwich City's recruitment team's desktop for a long period of time that have been built up. So, yeah, it's 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 incredibly exciting, and and even. You know, someone like Renier, who who didn't come from Real Madrid. I remember him being linked with Norwich previously. So these, the fact you're sort of seeing and, and, and hearing these names um, is is I think majorly encouraging about the type of direction they want to go down. This is a window that was fought out, that was pre-planned, that was, uh, you know, if jo- Johnny Rowe goes, here are our options that we want to go and and get. Um, and I think that's that's encouraging. So yeah, I, I agree with you that that strategy, that return to probably due diligence and process and. And, and whatnot is um, is yeah really encouraging for the for the for the long term, but equally for the short term as well. I was chatting to someone the other day. I mean, if there's such um, you know proactiveness and strategy around their first transfer window together, then goodness knows what you know the third, the fourth, the fifth transfer mm-hmm. window will bring. Just in terms of the outs, so let's just go over the top line in terms of the big ones. Gabby Saro went to Galatasaray for a fee that nobody really knows. Um, what was it, 15 million, 20 million quid, something like that? With De- six, definitely north of 20. Thousand. Definitely <laughs> north of 20. <laughs> okay. Um, Adam Eder for around about 9, 10 million. Johnny Rowe, um, initially a loan deal. That was raising to what, 17 million? 17, yeah. Yep. Uh, and then Abu Kamara got his his dream move to Hull City as well um, for, for, <laughs> for 5 million quid or whatever. So when you, when you go through that list, I mean... Math isn't great, but that's a, a significant amount of money. And I know you said at the top of this, Connor, that, you know, arguably we've lost two of last season's best players in Johnny Rowe and, and Gabby Sara. But we've got rid of a few players there that didn't want to be here um, yep. and for good money. And a couple of players that, you know, in Adam Eder wasn't our first choice strike and we picked up £10 million for. Them. I mean, that's a, that's a remarkable kind of transfer window in terms of outgoings. Yeah, it is. And I think I think Ben Napper deserves a huge amount of credit because uh, Celtic, for example, the Adam Eder deal, Celtic, their first bid was was about four point five million, and Norwich have basically got them to a position where they've where they've doubled that because they dug their heels in. They probably, and again, this is where it's kind of give and take. They probably kept an unhappy player for a little bit too long, and that does affect the, the dressing room. But equally, I think it was really important. Johnny Rowe case, probably the, the most high profile example of this, to send a message, to send a message to buying clubs, to send a message to agents, to players, to players within your dressing room that, yeah, we'll let you go if an opportunity comes up, but we'll do it on our terms. And I think the issue is as soon as you sell a player, one player for under the value, that's it then. You you yeah. give everyone else control. And I think that's what they've been able to do, even in the positions where externally maybe it's, it's looked like they don't have that control. A player's put in a transfer request or we had the episode with, with with Johnny Rowe at Oxford. They always managed to sort of retain that because of of how they've dealt with the the fee. I think Marseille had to make three bids before they they got to where Norwich wanted um, in, in terms of uh, valuation. Abu Kamara again. That was we're talking two free bids. So this is Norwich really holding firm. They they didn't collapse on any of their valuations, and they'd have been quite happy, even though it probably would have been detrimental to them in the in the short term, definitely to to keep those players if the valuation wasn't met. And I think well, I was I was going to say. Of, Tom- was was there ever a risk where, say, Marseille go, you know what, we don't think he's worth this, and we are left with Johnny yeah. Rowe? Was that a real situation? Yeah, hundred percent. If the if the valuation wasn't met, definitely. And, and I think then it obviously becomes a, a different situation. You have to manage that in a slightly different way. But um, and and I think with Marseille as well, what was what didn't help matters is particularly with their their first bid, where they threw that in on the day before a game, which is considered poor etiquette within the game, but. Usually there's a, you know, uh, Leeds are a good example. So so they picked up the phone and said, look, we're thinking of, you know, we like Johnny Rowe. We're thinking of seven million quid. Uh, then Norwich will say, look, if you put in a bid at that fee, we're going to laugh you out the room, whatever. And it was a 30 second conversation. There wasn't any of that with Marseille. It was, 
bam, here's a bid. Then it was bam, here's bid number two. There wasn't a lot of dialogue between the parties, certainly, but certainly with those first two bids, which I don't think helped matters in terms of getting that, that deal done. And, and again, probably at those points of adversity, Ben Napper has gone, do you know what? I'm going to dig my heels in even more. Um, and and I, th- I think that is to be applauded, really. But yeah, you're right. There's always there's always a risk that the other team walks away and, and then you have to deal with that. But equally, that is probably better to deal with than, than getting undervalued for a, for a player because, as I say, you do one that is slightly undervalued and I think that, that does hurt you and it does cost you in the long run. So a fresh squad, feeling fairly positive. We're, we're sat here during the first international break of the season. I mean, if we were to catch up at the next in, international break, I mean, where do you think we'll, we'll be at with things? And I get, I mean, it's we've got a little bit more clarity around the squad now and, and how things are working. So it's slightly easier to kind of predict the, 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 the kind of lay of the land in the championship. And we've seen other teams. And I must say, other than, well, I've not really seen a standout team so far. I think Leeds are probably the, the one that everyone looks at. But their leads and we know that the frailties around that side Burnley Luton haven't looked great Sheffield United have Chris Wildery but it feels like there's there's opportunity to to maybe do something this year Connor and that's not me piling pressure on and look, I'm not necessarily expecting that to happen but surely within the club they're seeing this as an opportunity that doesn't happen very often in the championship where you will get a couple of outliers really break through Definitely, definitely. I 100% agree. And I think you're right. And, and look, we're four games in, so there's still time for Burnley, for um, for Luton to, to recover and really make that charge. But it does feel at the moment a really open division. It doesn't feel like those teams that have come down are as strong as the ones that were in the league last year. Um, you don't have, uh, dare I say, a, a, an Ipswich in, in, in the mix either. It does feel really open. It feels like an opportunity for a team to really make a challenge if they can if they can get the performances right. And I think that's why this stage of the season is so important and why there's so much optimism because I've always been a great believer in football um, in, in that if you can get your performances there, OK, look, you, you might not get the result every week, but by and large, if you can get a consistent level of high performance um, in, in your, not to sound like other podcasts, but if you, if you can <laughs> if you can get yourself in that position, then it does t- tend to yield results. Um, you know, and, and Daniel Farker in Norwich is, is probably a good example, but there are, there are others as well. You could point to Paul Lambert, um, his era, Alex Neal's era. They, they did that pretty consistently. The good periods at this football club have come when they've, had a really solid base of performances to build upon it. So that's what they need to get to again. And if they can build that, and you know, it does feel like over the last three games they have, and I'm sure there'll be wobbles and there'll be bits because it's a 46-game season. But if you can if you can do that and continue in the way that they're going, there's absolutely no reason why they couldn't be the team that that really makes their case at the top end of the league. Um, because as you said, there's so many teams at the moment in flux and in transition and with new managers and with players who are you know, in the position that we spoke about where they've got players who don't want to be there or players that have signed that need to gel. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really open and there's an opportunity. And like you say, where there's an opportunity, you just hope that Norwich City can, can step into that. And off the basis of what we've seen after the last three weeks, I think everybody probably inside the club, but, but equally in the fan base as well, has probably gone from, you know, we can't, so why not? And I think that is a really interesting change in position, like we said, from Oxford, which was just a month ago, where we were speaking about cultures and you know having to root out bad eggs and all of that type of thing, to now be in a position where you say, yeah, wh- why why can't Norwich? And um, yeah, of course, there'll be lots of other teams asking that same question. But the fact that Norwich are even in that sphere of conversation, I think, shows how how much they've developed over the last few weeks. Absolutely. All very exciting. Um, well, Colin, I just want I know I've said it to you personally, but fantastic work over uh, over what's been an incredibly frantic you. summer um you and paddy Thank and all you. the other gents at the pinkin and uh i'm sure everyone watching this does already read uh, your work but um, well worth checking out if not um there we go thanks very much connor and uh, an exciting time ahead for norwich city